Hello, this is my five minute take on what I call the social invisibility of women in the Bible and the world around them. And, and as you'll see, we kind of continue it ourselves. To begin, 14 times in Acts of the Apostles, either Paul or Peter begins a speech with, in Greek, Andres Adelphoi, that is, men brothers, and we're not talking generic human being, masculine persons, brothers, and then you have the speech. Now, these are in public places. Do you think there are no women there? Of course there are women there, but they're not recognized in the address, and they're not recognized in the language, because in these languages, when you have a mixed group uh, of men and women, uh, grammatically, they make it masculine plural. So you never know, even in the language, whether women are represented. That's in spite of women owning property and inheriting property and, and, uh, and with some social power, though they didn't have the vote in, in local elections. But when you hear an expression like, the disciples around Jesus, what do you imagine? Do you imagine 12 men? Or do you imagine a mixed group? We know that there were women disciples. We have names of some of them. But sometimes the, the portraiture and, and, and our imagination doesn't take them in. Or an expression um, in Ephesians 3, 5, for example, the letter to the Ephesians. The mystery revealed by God, by, sorry, by God's holy apostles and prophets. What do you imagine there? 12 men, and then Isaiah and Jeremiah and people like that. Well, we know that there are uh, other people who had the title apostle. Junia, for example, in, in Romans 16. Junia and Dronicus, probably a husband-wife team. Paul calls them apostles, and there are other examples. And prophets, what about prophets? There are women prophets in Corinth in Paul's day. He talks about women who pray and prophesy. His problem is what they wear on their heads when they do it, but he never uh, suggests that they should not be prophesying. In Luke chapter 2, Anna, who is in the temple, is called a prophet. We have women prophets in the Old Testament. We have Huldah and Deborah and people like that. Now, here's the interesting thing, is that so many of them do not appear in the lectionary at all. Miriam, the sister of Moses, has um, a key role in the whole celebration of the Exodus event in Exodus 15. But that part of the, of the narrative isn't there. Some of it from before the reference to her and some of it from after the reference to her are there. But Miriam does not appear. Deborah, the prophet, the entire Judges uh, chapters 4 and 5 do not appear in the lectionary. And there's wonderful material there about Deborah, who is a judge and a prophet. And they have to, to there's a military campaign to launch. Barak is the leader. And he says, I'm not going unless you come along. And, and Deborah says, yes, I will come along. So she's even involved in their, their necessary um, military work. So there are people there who don't appear. Prime example in the New Testament is Phoebe. At the beginning of Romans 16, Phoebe is a, a deacon and a benefactor of Paul, a, a patron of Paul. It's verses 1 and 2 where Phoebe is mentioned. The lectionary begins at verse 3, and it simply leaves her out. She never appears. Another example is the wonderful story of um, Mary Magdalene and Jesus in, in John chapter 20 in the, at the tomb. That's there, but it's on Tuesday when not many people are going to Mass instead of being featured. Now, do I think that the lectionary editor sat down and said, we're going to deliberately exclude all these women? No, I don't think that at all. What I think is that they did not consider the women important to talk about, to, to bring forth in the lectionary. And we are the, uh, the losers for that. And so what we need to do is to recover those wonderful stories of women, and maybe in a new edition of the lectionary, they will get the point that they are important. I rest my case. <laughs>